In this video, we're going to talk about windows and windowing as they apply in the subject domain of digital signal processing. Windows um, are, are things through which we see the outside world. Now on this slide, we see two examples of that. Uh, we see a large window on the left through which we see a great deal of the world, and then on the right, a small window through which we can only see a small piece of the outside world. We use windows in digital signal processing in a similar way to through which we view signals. So we can either view a large portion of a signal or we can view a small part of a signal as we'll see. Here we see the windowing property of the discrete time Fourier transform. And what this says in English is that if in the time domain we multiply a given signal x by a window function w to obtain a signal y. In the Fourier domain, the corresponding operation is uh, periodic convolution between the Fourier transforms of x and w. So it will be important for us to think about the Fourier transform of the window and look at its structure and properties uh, because essentially what's happening when we look through a window in the time domain look through a window at a signal in the time domain. In the frequency domain, we're performing a smearing operation, which is what this convolution is doing. OK, on, on this slide, we see um, w uh, two windows in the time domain and their corresponding Fourier transforms in the frequency domain. And uh, this slide also establishes some of the jargon that we're going to use as we talk about windows. So let's start in the time domain. Um, first of all, we're looking at two different windows here. The blue line is the rectangular window, and the orange line here is uh, another window known as the Hamming window. These have been scaled so that um, the sum of the values is equal to 1. And um, <clears throat> what that does is it, it forces the Fourier transforms to have a unity DC gain. So 0 dB gain in the frequency domain. So it's just a scale factor difference. Uh, not too much to worry about right at the moment. But um, one of the things that I want to point out here is that there are um, two attributes of windows that we're going to focus our attention on. One of those is the length of the window. In this case, both of these windows have length 50, as you can see here in the graph. So uh, we'll use the letter L to denote uh, the length of the window. Um, and the other thing that we're going to talk about here is the shape. So we have pictured here two different window shapes, the rectangular window and then the Hamming window. In the frequency domain, you can see the Fourier transforms of these two window functions uh, with the corresponding colors. Now, um, there are certain properties of the Fourier transform that we're going to refer to. Uh, the first being the main lobe, and you can see that here is the center lobe centered around zero frequency of the Fourier transform. It's the one where most of the energy of the signal lies. And then we'll also refer to side lobes. So uh, the side lobes are all of the lobes of the transform except for the main lobe. Now a couple of the features that we're going to be referring to um, about the main lobe are its width. So you can see that the rectangular window in the time domain has a narrower main lobe in the frequency domain. So uh, here you see the uh, Hamming window has a, has a lobe that's about twice as wide as the main lobe for the rectangular window. Also the side lobes uh, well, the, the thing that's important for us to notice here on the side lobes is the level. So we would say that the side lobes of the rectangular window are higher than the side lobes of the Hamming window. So we'll talk about side lobe height and main lobe width. So one of the things that we see immediately is that the uh, structure of the Fourier transform is set by the structure of the time domain signal and that um, the rectangular window, we'll, we'll see, has the narrowest main lobe of all windows of a given length. And then as you change the shape, what that does is it broadens the main lobe, 
and decreases the side lobes. The other thing that we'll um, be talking about is zero padding. So um, because we're using a length L window to observe the signal, what we're going to do is, uh, remember thinking back to the, the Fourier pro uh, property, we're going to multiply a large signal by a window. So we're essentially looking through the window function at this longer signal. The resulting windowed signal will have length L, the same as the length of the window function. But you can see that when we multiply by the rectangular window, we don't modify the values of the signal inside the window, whereas when we multiply by the Hamming window, we're actually going to um, increase the values of the signal in the center, and we'll taper and attenuate the values of the signal toward the ends. Um, also, the, the length of the Fourier transform that we will use to do the signal analysis will be length n. And if n is greater than L, so n is the length of the transform, L is the length of the windowed signal, if n is greater than L, then we're es essentially filling in the rest of that um, data vector with zeros, and that's known as zero padding. We've talked about this in other videos. Zero padding um, gives us more samples of the underlying signal, but it doesn't change the underlying shape of the, the signal that's being sampled in the frequency domain. The shapes of these waveforms in the frequency domain is set by the shapes in the time domain. So here's a few principles to keep in mind, and we'll look at illustrations of these. Um, the first has to do with shape. As, we, as we've noticed, the shape of the window controls the height of the side lobes in the frequency domain. As we'll see, the side lobes of the window in the frequency domain control a feature that we're going to describe as leakage. Leakage is when energy that is um, when when there's energy in the signal X that's energy that's concentrated at a, a narrow band of frequencies in the signal X appears smeared out and distributed over a large band of frequencies in the signal Y through the operation of windowing. So that's leakage. And it's controlled by the height of the side lobes. When the side lobes are higher, there will be more leakage. The problem with leakage is that small signals or weak signals, uh, signals that have low amplitude, can be hidden beneath the side lobes of a strong signal. We'll look at examples of that. The other property um, that has to do with the main lobe is both the length and the shape. So the um, length and shape control the width of the main lobe. The longer the window, the narrower the main lobe in general. And you can also control the main lobe width um, to a lesser degree by selecting different shaped windows. The main lobe controls the resolution. Um, of the uh, transformed data. And generally, you want a narrower uh, main lobe to have higher resolution. We'll look at examples of this. What is resolution? It's the ability to distinguish closely spaced sinusoids. So we'll um, take a look at that. But before we do, um, I'd like to go to the Wikipedia page for um, Windows and let, let me just point out what this is. This is the windowing function page in Wikipedia. And you can read more there. But um, they provide many examples of window functions, both in the time domain on the left in blue and in the frequency domain on the right. So um, the thing I want to point out here is that this is a, uh, a length n uh, window. Uh, the rectangular window is constant amplitude in the time domain. And in the Fourier domain, frequency domain, uh, notice we have this very narrow main lobe, but the side lobes are quite high, and they do roll off. So let's uh, toggle through and look at some examples of windows. Um, after the rectangular window, we come to the triangular window, uh, which attenuates um, signal samples at the edges, and uh, does not attenuate at all in the center. Notice the difference between 
in the frequency domain the Fourier transform of the triangular window and the tr and the, the rectangular window. If I toggle back and forth you can see that the rectangular window has a narrower main lobe, higher side lobes, and if we go to the, the triangular window we have a broadening of the main lobe and then the side lobes are actually lower. After the triangular window there's a Parson window. Again just pay attention to side lobe levels and main lobe width and then also think about the shape of the window in the time domain. This is known as the Welch window, the half sign window, the Hahn window. This is a very good window for spectral analysis, or it's used a lot. The Hamming window, another popular window function. Blackman again another popular one in digital signal processing. It has very low side lobes and they, they roll off. Notice that the first side lobe is down about minus 60 dB from the peak. Uh, this is the Nuttall window and its first side lobes are below minus 90 dB but to have low side lobes the price you pay is a wide main lobe. And then notice in the time domain how it's really focusing attention at the center and tapering quite quite strongly towards the edges. The Blackman Nuttall window, Blackman Harris, flat topped window, and the list goes on and on. Gaussian, confined Gaussian, Tukey. Plank taper window, and uh, they become more and more exotic. Kaiser window is a very popular one. It has an adjustable parameter, and as you adjust the parameter, you can change the shape of the window, and that affects the level of the side lobes and the width of the main lobe. Dolph Chebyshev, its side lobes are all uniformly below um, 100 decibels. So that's very popular. Ultraspherical, the list goes on and on. Exponential, Bartlett-Hahn, and I'll let you explore the rest of those on Wikipedia. So now let's go into MATLAB and look at some examples of the windowing property. Um, first I'd like to show you the script that I'm going to run um, and uh, the way I'm going to use it. So first of all we set up some signal parameters. I choose some frequencies, 0.2 cycles per sample and 0.21 cycles per sample. I'm choosing these two frequencies because they're very close together. They're one hundredth of a cycle per sample different in frequency. Um, I have two parameters here, A0 and A1, which set the amplitudes of these two sinusoids. They're complex exponentials actually. So in the beginning here we'll see that uh, the first sinusoid is turned on and the second one is turned off. And then as I, t I change those values I can turn them on and off and set their amplitudes to different values. Um, L will be the length of my signal that I'm using. And then I have 2 to the 18, that's about a quarter million, um, will be the DFT or the FFT size. So you can see there's quite a bit of zero padding taking place here because N is larger than L. Now for the signal generation part. So I'm going to construct a signal which is um, two complex exponentials. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm building a matrix that's L by 2. Um, let me just show you these examples here. If I, um, if I show you, uh, let's see, 0 colon L minus 1, that's a vector of indexes that go from 0 to 49. And then when I multiply that times um, a vector f0, f1, it basically does n times f, and it uh, creates um, a, a 50 by 2 matrix. Then when I evaluate the, D, uh, the complex exponential at those frequencies and times, it gives me two complex exponential sequences in the columns of this matrix. And then when I multiply by the signal amplitudes, um, a 2 by 1 vector. It combines those 
uh, complex exponentials um, in a linear fashion. So it constructs a signal which um, has, uh, which is a complex signal that's the sum of two complex exponentials. Okay, so if you want to, you can go into MATLAB and play around with those ideas. Um, I'm also in some cases going to add noise. So here I'm creating a complex uh, noise process. Uh, I'm setting its amplitude to zero, so in the beginning it's not going to play a role. But then down here I add the noise to the signal, and then we continue. So signal analysis is where the windowing takes place. So first of all, I construct a rectangular window as my baseline for comparison. Um, and I also construct a Hamming window in this case. We'll also look at Blackman windows and Hahn windows. Um, after constructing the window and before applying it to the signal, I divide the window by the sum of the absolute values of the samples in the window. Uh, again, this simply scales the window so that it will have zero DC gain in the frequency domain. Or, I'm sorry, unity gain in the frequency domain, zero dB. And then finally, when the window has been created and scaled appropriately, I apply that to a signal X the complex exponential signal that we were just looking at by doing a point for point multiply between the data in X and the window uh, in this vector called W rect. And I do the same thing down here. I scale the Hamming window. Uh, this is how you construct a Hamming window in MATLAB. I scale it and then apply it to the data. So here's when we say we're looking at a signal through a window, this is where that operation is taking place. We're doing the point for point multiplication and um, that's going to be uh, uh, that's applying the window. Okay, and the rest of the the rest of this script is basically just plotting, so we're going to ignore that, and we'll come back over here into our control script. And I've already run this, so you can see what's happening. Let's take a look. Um, on the top left, we see the um, original signal X windowed by a rectangular window, so there's basically no windowing going on here at all because the the windowing, um, the rectangular window is constant, so there's not really much operationally taking place. Um, you can see the rectangular window over here on the right. You also see the Hamming window as before, it's length 50, and so you can see the effect of applying the Hamming window is that we're actually um, giving some uh, gain, we're amplifying the signals in the center of the window, and then we're attenuating the signals at the edge of the window. This is the real part of the complex exponential signal. All right, down at the bottom of the page, we're looking at the Fourier transforms of the rectangular window and of the Hamming window. I'm not going to say much about that right now because we've looked at that already. What I want to do is focus our attention now on this chart in the middle. So um, what we're looking at here is, um, remember, this is the, the signal that's being transformed here are, are these signals, these complex exponential signals. So in one case, we have um, the Fourier transform. Um, well, and, and let's back up and remember, what's the Fourier transform of a complex exponential over a finite window? You know that it's a sinc function, and that's essentially the sinc function that we're looking at here, but uh, scaled so that the y-axis is in units of decibels. This blue line that you see down here, this is that sinc function that we're all familiar with. It's been uh, through the convolution in the frequency domain, that sinc function has been repositioned at the center of one of our frequencies. These two red lines are the frequencies of our input signals. Remember, um, we're not, uh, we have kept the second signal turned off, so we're not seeing uh, any action take place there, but um, we see this, um, these window functions in the Fourier domain being repositioned through convolution at the frequency of our input signal. If we were to, um, well, let, let's, do, let's just do a couple of things here before we go on. First, I want to um, change the length of our window. Let's go from 50 up to 100. We'll run this again, see how that changes things. Okay, so now what we've done is we've changed the amount of data 
that we're transforming. We've changed the length of the window. We were using a small window before, and 50 samples. We've doubled that now, and now we have a 50 or 100 sample window. So we're wider in the time domain, which means we're going to be narrower in the frequency domain. And uh, as expected, as we predicted, when for, for wider windows in the time domain, we have a narrower main lobe in the frequency domain. Uh, we can push this uh, even further. Let's go with 1,000, another factor of 2. Now here you can see that we have a very narrow main lobe in the frequency domain. The side lobes, however, really haven't changed much. Um, they're at about the same level as they were before. Notice that this first side lobe for the rectangular window is down about 13 decibels below the main peak. If we go back to the 50 sample window and look at it again, you'll see that the same is true uh, for this case. So here the uh, side lobe, that first side lobe is down about 13 decibels from the main lobe. So you can see in these examples that as the length of the window in the time domain increases, the length of the main lobe uh, decreases. And so we get better resolution. Let's look at an example where resolution is important. Let's suppose we have two sinusoids. So I'm changing the amplitude of our second complex exponential signal. We have two sinusoids that are closely spaced in frequency. I have 0.2 and 0.21 cycles per sample. I'm going to use a 50 sample window. Uh, th uh, to do my analysis. Let's take a look and see what happens. Okay, so now in this case uh, we can see that we have our two frequencies and you, we have to imagine what's taking place. Um, we get a copy of each one of these windows located at each frequency um, of our input signals and those replicas add together. So whereas down here we see a lot of structure in the side lobes we have just enough of an offset so that when we add these um, overlapping functions together, we get this uh, almost a constant signal as we move away from the main lobe. So we're getting kind of this interfering, constructive and destructive uh, interference pattern taking place in the side lobe area. But again, you can see that um, we, have, we have two sinusoids in our signal, although if you were looking at this signal, um, through the Fourier transform, through the window that, we've, um, that we're using here, you would probably, if you had to guess, you'd probably say that eh, there's only one sinusoid present because we see only one lobe. And this also highlights the concept of resolution. These, these main lobes are so wide that we're not able to resolve these two frequencies that are spaced um, closely together. So how do we get better resolution? Let's narrow that main lobe up by going with a longer window function and let's see what happens. Okay, here we can see that we're actually now able to resolve that there are two sinusoidal signals present. If we wanted to do an even better job, what we would, what we would do is maybe go with an even longer window. Yeah, now, now in this case we have enough length, we have enough signal samples that we can clearly see that there are two frequency components present. Uh, to illustrate the, effect, the, uh, the harmful effects of high side lobes, let's suppose we have a very weak signal, and it doesn't even have to be close. Let's put it far away from the, from the first one. Let's go back to our 50 sample window. Now notice that um, we have a, a signal component at point 2 and then we have a very weak signal component, component out here at point 4. Notice that uh, with the rectangular window the side lobes are so high that we're not really clearly able to see that there's um, energy present at point 4 um, cycles per sample. 
but due to the lower side lobes of the Hamming window, we're able to get a clearer picture of what's going on. Let's try increasing the length again. Now we just are barely able to distinguish that there's um, a signal present if we were to use a rectangular window to do our analysis. But with the Hamming window, we're, we're able to very clearly um, see that we have signal energy rising up above the side lobe levels. Let's increase by another factor of 10. And let's zoom in out here near this extra signal. Again, we can see that um, with the high side lobes of the rectangular window, still a little bit of a difficult call, but with the Hamming window, there's no question. The uh, signal is sufficiently strong that it rises up above the side lobes of the Hamming window. Um, let's also, while we're here, um, let's go take a look at uh, a different window. Let's take a look at, say, the Han window instead of the Hamming. The nice feature of the, ha the Han window, unlike the Hamming, which has fairly flat side lobes, the Han window um, has uh, side lobes that decay as you move away from the main lobe. So again, notice how quickly the um, side lobes of the Han window decay. That means there's not going to be very much leakage when we go to frequencies far away. And um, yeah, clearly you can see that with the Han window, there's no question that we're able to resolve that there's this extra signal component. It's a very weak signal component, but it's definitely there. Whereas doing the analysis with the rectangular window, uh, it's a little questionable about whether there's a signal present or not. Uh, maybe when we're dealing with perfectly clean um, signals, that's not much of an issue. But if you add a little bit of noise, let's see what happens when we add a little bit of noise. Um, yeah, here we see the issue with the uh, rectangular window. You know, that... that uh, Excursion in the blue line could simply be due to a blip of noise. It's tough to say, but with the Han window, you know, we're looking at quite a few dB of um, rise above the background side lobe level. And of course, that effect is more dramatic as we go to shorter windows. Let's go to 500 and um, even 100. The point of this exercise is that you, as the engineer, have some choices to make when you're doing signal analysis with the DFT. You get to choose the amount of data that you're plugging into the transform. You get to choose the size of the transform itself. And you get to choose the shape of the window being used. Let's take a look at the Blackman window. For the same problem. The thing I want to point out with the Blackman window um, is that it's known to have very good side lobes. Uh, first side lobe level is down about 60 dB below the main lobe peak, so its side lobes are very far below the rectangular side lobes, so there's going to be little spectral leakage. Um, and the uh, side lobes also attenuate as you move away from the main lobe. But the Blackman also has quite a wide main lobe. Um, I want to go back to a previous example and talk about um, uh, leakage again. Let's look at this as an example. Um, first of all, I want to point out, let's, uh, just to emphasize the concept of leakage. So in this case, Let's even go back to this case where there's no energy in the other, in the second signal component. So remember what leakage is. We know in the 
in an everlasting complex exponential signal, all of its energy is concentrated at one point, at one frequency, because the Fourier transform is a delta function, a Dirac delta function. When we look at that signal through a finite length window, no matter what that window shape is, we will have leakage. Some energy will spill into other frequencies. And we see that that's uh, fairly dramatic here with the rectangular window because it has high side lobes. We see energy getting spread over basically the entire frequency band from minus 0.5 to 0.5, all because we have this um, finite length signal that we're analyzing. The leakage is um, less for windows that have lower side lobe levels, like the Hamming window that we see here, but it still is present. And, and remember, what resolution is, is the ability to resolve closely spaced sinusoids. Um, and then to have high resolution, in general, we want to have long window functions. Let's go crazy 10,000 uh, length window. And <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Um, here, so here it's very obvious that we have two signal components. There's no question. So we would say this is very high resolution because the, the main lobes of these windows is so narrow. So we would say we have high resolution because we have a narrow main lobe. And again, you get different main lobe widths for different window shapes, uh, but it's generally true that when you increase the length of the window, you decrease the length of the main lobe. So by um, trading off signal or, or window shape and window length, you can get the desired uh, main lobe width and side lobe level for the analysis that you want to do. I'm going to go uh, look at some other examples here. Um, Besides analyzing signals, we can also analyze impulse responses. And um, the first one that I'd like to take a look at is a simple low-pass filter whose impulse response is a sync function. Now remember, the ideal low-pass filter has an impulse response which is an everlasting sync function. Its tails decay out to minus infinity and plus infinity. But we can't do analysis on an, ev on an everlasting signal like that. So we're going to look at it through a window function. Um, here we're looking at the sync function. Uh, the blue line is when we use a rectangular window to look at that sync function, and the orange line is when we, we use a Hamming window to look at that sync function. In the frequency domain, we're convolving the uh, Fourier transform, uh, which you see down here on the bottom. This is in dB scale, and then this is linear uh, magnitude scale. So these are the magnitudes of the Fourier transforms of these window functions. And then in the middle, we see uh, on the left in decibels and on the right a linear magnitude plot. After we've done the convolution of the transforms of these window functions with the ideal low pass filter. Uh, one of the things that's, uh, that we expect to see when we truncate with a window a, a long impulse response like a sync function is that we get this Gibbs type effect. And, and we've seen this sort of thing before. Uh, around the discontinuity of the ideal low-pass filter, we get this Gibbs effect. Now, um, the, there's, there's two effects going on, and one is due to the main lobe width, and one is due to the side lobe level. So remember that the rectangular window has high side lobes, and so the stop band attenuation for this low-pass filter, if we use a rectangular window, is going to be quite high, as you see here in the dB plot. The other thing that you see uh, that's quite pronounced in the linear plot is that you see all these ripples both in the pass band and in the stop band. But notice how much those ripples are attenuated, both the ripple in the pass band and the ripple in the stop band, which is the, the stop band attenuation. Notice how much those are attenuated as we use a window with a different shape. Why does that happen? That happens because the ripples are caused by the side lobes of the window function. So if you want to have low ripples, uh, choose a window function that has low side lobes. Um, the other thing that we're going to have to zoom in to see, to appreciate here, is the um, transition from pass band 
to stop band. Notice that the transition or, or that this transition band, the width of this transition band as we transition from the pass band to the stop band is narrower for the rectangular window. So, so we would say that the, probably the pass band edge stops right here at this frequency and then um, the stop band edge starts right here maybe around this frequency here. And notice how quickly this blue line transitions from a gain of 1 to a gain of 0. It's pretty rapid. The orange line, on the other hand, takes longer to make the transition from pass band to stop band. Why is that? That has to do with the main lobe width. So the width of the transition band in a filter is going to be related to the width of the main lobe in the window. Um, whereas the attenuation in the, in the different bands, the pass band and the stop band, that's going to be a function of the side lobe level. So here we're learning a little bit uh, about uh, filter design. Um, so uh, in this example, once again, when we use a shaped window, like a Hamming window, we get low side lobes in the frequency domain. So that's going to give us low ripple, both in the pass band and the stop band. But we get a wider transition from the uh, pass band to the stop band, which is less desirable. Usually you want a very rapid transition from one band to the next. So this is an example with a low pass filter. Let's take a look at an example with another filter that performs uh, or approximates the derivative in discrete time. Um, on the top uh, we see the impulse response of a differentiator. Uh, in this case the length is about 61 samples. Uh, we see the window functions here on the top right, the Fourier transforms of the window functions down here on the bottom, and then in the middle on the left the dB magnitude response of a differentiator, and then on the right the um, uh, linear magnitude response of the differentiator. Now um, you'll just have to take my word for this at the moment, but the, the ideal differentiator would have a linear response um, between 0 and it, uh, by the time you get to 1 half it should go up to about pi. And you see that this is on its way to do that. Um, notice that when we use a rectangular window, when we basically just truncate this um, everlasting function, uh, we get this really ripply kind of behavior. Again, that's due to the uh, side lobes um, of the rectangular window high side lobes, whereas with the Hamming window we have low side lobes and that gives us a very smooth um, line here in the magnitude response in the frequency domain. We could also look at um, other window functions, for example maybe we could try the Blackman window. Um, again uh, not much difference here in this example, um, at least not much that's di visible to the eye. But uh, again, we get a nice effect here if we use a shaped window instead of the rectangular window. So once again, um, to summarize, what we've done is looked at the effect of using different window shapes in the time domain. And uh, the, the important principle is that um, you want to have, generally speaking, a narrow main lobe, which, e which means either a shaped window or a long window, and we want to have low side lobes, which means a shaped window. And again, you can choose uh, different window shapes to get different side lobe levels.